Thank you. Thank you. So the chair was being chaired. <laughs> Okay, so as, as Deborah so kindly said, uh, this paper will focus first on an essay on the admission of women, if I can move this, okay, here it is, uh, to the parliamentary franchise, uh, the pamphlet that Anna Kingsford published in 1868. So she wrote this essay at a particular time in her life because on the last day of 1867 she had married Algernon Kingsford, a distant cousin. The young couple had then moved to Litchfield where Algernon trained to become a clergyman. And Anna gave birth to their only child, Edith, on the 24th of September 1868, meaning that Kingsford wrote this essay most probably as a newly married, pregnant, 21-year-old woman. Now, Kingsford's biographer, Alan Pert, explains that in 1868, Kingsford had gathered signatures on a petition for married women's rights to keep control of their property. Well, one has to remember that at the time, any money made by a married woman and any property she had before getting married automatically became her husband's property. In 1868, a married women's property bill was introduced to Parliament, the one Kingsford had gathered signatures for, and she published her essay when the campaign was still going on because the bill was passed in 1870 only and it was very limited. Now, the fact that Kingsford had petitioned in support of this reform just before she wrote this essay is quite significant. First of all, because she was about to get married herself. Kingsford came from a wealthy, upper-middle-class family. And when her father died in 1865, he gave her 5,000 pounds in his will, which is a huge sum of money at the time. However, he had put her money in a trust fund and made it clear in his will that any husband of hers would have no control over the interest she got from it. According to various sources, Kingsford's inheritance brought her between 700 and 900 pounds a year, which meant she was a, a wealthy woman. So she petitioned from the standpoint of those very rare married women who had kept some control over their property and had some financial independence. Some only indeed, as denounced by Kingsford herself in her essay, clearly drawing from her own legal situation. This is what she wrote. If provision has been made beforehand for settling her money on herself, yet, though the hard cash may be hers, she has no individual right to any article purchased by it. All investments made by her become her husband's property as soon as they're made so that, in reality, she reaps but little advantage from a settlement beyond the mere right to sign checks. Kingsford also had a thought for her less fortunate uh, sisters, other women, adding, moreover, the process of settlement itself is a mere evasion of the law, attainable only by the rich. Now, the second important point is that Kingsford's petitioning in support of the Married Women's Property Bill shows that she already was in contact with the women of the Langham Place group in London who had organized the petition. Their leader, Barbara Lee Smith Bardisham, had published Reasons for the Enfranchisement of Women in 1866 an essay that Kingsford had most certainly read. Which leads me to the general context in which Kingsford's essay was published. A campaign for women's suffrage had emerged in the mid-1860s when the Second Reform Bill was being debated. The movement brought together three different groups. The Langham Place group, launched by Bardisham, but also Elizabeth Rayner Parks, and later joined by Emily Faithful and Emily Davis. The group had been involved since the mid-1850s with campaigns for legal and educational reform for women. Then there was a group of liberal or radical academics and politicians centered around John Stuart Mill and his stepdaughter Helen Taylor that included Henry Fawcett and his wife Millicent Garrett Fawcett. 
And last but not least, there was a provincial network of suffragists, of which the Manchester group, led by Lydia Baker, was the most important. The breakthrough had come in 1865 when John Stuart Mill was returned to Parliament as a radical MP on a platform that included women's suffrage. Probably show Emily Davis, Elizabeth Garrett and Dorothy Beale had then launched a women's suffrage petition. Kingsford had closely followed their campaign. In an essay, she writes, Ms. Mrs. Bardichon, Mrs. Stuart Mill, Miss Helen Taylor and others have written ably on the matter. And she adds, and she actually expresses the same limited demands as those voiced in the petition that asked for the suffrage to unmarried women and widows on the same terms and conditions on which it is or may be granted to men, that is in 1867, to freeholders, householders and ratepayers only. Kingsford published an essay in a difficult and frustrating immediate context. Mill added an amendment to the 1867 Reform Act so that it would give women the same political rights as men. But the amendment was defeated and the second reform bill became law without any recognition of votes for women. Suffragists did not give up, however. In 1868, no less than 78 petitions were presented for women's suffrage with 50,000 signatures in all. This was when the National Society for Women's Suffrage was founded, to which King Ford, as she says in her essays, had the honour to be a member. It was a loose federation, actually, that she presents to her readers at the end of her essay as a society at work in London, Manchester and Edinburgh for the promotion of women's rights in one particular of female suffrage. Now, in Manchester, Lydia Becker led a vigorous campaign for women ratepayers to be registered to vote anyway after Lily Maxwell, whose name had been put accidentally on the electoral register, had managed to vote. But in 1868, the Court of Common Pleas decided against the women who had claimed their right to vote. But anyway, Kingsford actually remained closer to the London campaigners, whose stance was more cautious than Becker's, who had links with the working class politics of the North. The staunchly middle and upper middle class London group defined a moderate and class-biased form of feminism. Their influence on Kingsford is obvious in a text that shows a completely uncritical acceptance of the property terms of the Victorian male franchise. Kingsford is only concerned with the lack of logic of the electoral system. If property men could vote, why not property women, asserting her rights as a female member of the property class. She only calls for the enfranchisement of certain among the sex, these are her words, for, she says, her share of the privileges and immunities granted to men of corresponding condition. And she uses the argument of no taxation without representation. She says if women pay rates and taxes to support the government, then it is right that she should have a claim upon it although female ratepayers, all of them single or widowed, only were a minority among Victorian women. Kingsford essay reveals ambiguities, tensions in her feminist views. It opens on the classical outcry against the condition imposed on women by her patriarchal society. And you have uh, the page here. To those men who cry out so loudly that women's inferior attainments and requirements prove them inferior in capacity and intellect, I answer this. Who deny to women every means of superior education and nobler training? Who push them back into the nursery and the kitchen and tell them their duty and their sphere is there and their only? Why? These men themselves. But just a few lines below, 
Kingsford also blames women for their condition. She says, women themselves are generally their own enemies. They have no ambition. And then she focuses on a generic upper middle class woman and she wonders, what does she do? Absolutely nothing. Her time is spent in frivolous employments and amusements, embroidery, novels and similar absurdities. And further down, she even laments one general trait that distinguishes women of all classes everywhere, I mean their peevishness. Well, eventually, she eventually concludes that all of this is due to women's defective education and then she develops this issue in her essay. But she does so, this issue of education, she tackles it exclusively from an upper middle class point of view. However, Kingsford also asks her readers to exercise their body healthily and forego stays and all other hurtful fashions of dress. Now, Kingsford's focus on the female bo body is certainly the most subversive point of her essay. First of all, she denounces girls, well, middle and upper class ones, obviously, girls' lack of physical training. She wonders, where are the cricket clubs for girls? Where are the boxing gloves? The foot races, the fencing matches, the paper chairs, the gymnasiums, and the hundred brave and health-giving games that boys enjoy. Then, five years before she embarked on her medical studies, she denounces the, I quote, strenuous opposition and ridicule Miss Garrett has met in a portrait of the science she loves, the novel science of medicine. Elizabeth Garrett Anderson was Millicent Garrett Fawcett's sister and an active member of the Langham Place group herself. She was the first woman physician qualified in Britain who managed to get her name into the British Medical Register in 1865, but only by way of a complex loophole that was then immediately closed until 1876. Consequently, uh, in 1868, in an essay, Kingsford still wondered how can the grand science of medicine be fully developed and appreciated by the human race unless both sexes study it alike? So Kingsford's interest in medicine clearly springs from a feminist view. Contrary to many advocates of women physicians, Kingsford's main argument was not that of female patients' modesty, but that only women physicians could probably understand and cure female ailments, which was also for her a way for women as a whole to regain control of their bodies. And as such, it echoes Josephine Butler's contemporary campaign against the Contagious Diseases Act that subjected alleged prostitutes to forced genital examination by male physicians. Now, <coughs> oh, okay, here I go. Kingsford's concern with women's control of their own bodies takes her very far. Toward the end of the essay, she entreats, that's her word, to read The Elements of Social Science, a book, she says, that contains brave, honest truth. Subtitled Physical, Sexual and Natural Religion, an exposition of the true cause and only cure of the three primary social evils, poverty, prostitution and celibacy, the book was first published in 1857. By 1868, it was a bestseller, but a notorious one, nicknamed the Bible of the Brothel. So, Kingsford was really subversive in commending it to her readers. Indeed, the book describes in details and in plain language male and female sexual anatomy, reproduction and all the known methods of contraception. 
and I read the whole thing and I wanted to prove to you how subversive it was for the time. And this is what I found which I think you'll understand as very subversive. It even mentions, I quote, a small erectile organ, the clitoris, probably the chief organ of sexual enjoyment. That's for saying. The book also dwells at length on the negative and the negative mental and physical consequences of abstinence and calls for a new science-based religion that would reference the body as highly as the spirit. So the book was published anonymously, but it was written by George Drisdell, a free thinker, and as mentioned by Kingsford, it was published by Edward Trulove, a well-known free-thinking publisher. Now, according to Alan Pert, in 1868, when King's Ford wrote an essay, she had tried to launch a ladies' <coughs> secular club to bring together free-thinking women. And indeed, King's Ford writes in a provocative manner in an essay, you have the quote here, the religion of the world provides in many of its doctrines a handle to humbug and oppression which men are not slow to seize upon and to grind without pity. She also remarks most sarcastically that supernatural religion is almost invariably a stronger influence with plain girls and disappointed or superannuated maids than with any other persons of either sex. Now, to go back uh, to Drisdall, just here we go. Drisdall, in his chapter, Woman the Physician, also advocates women doctors. He says, when woman relies on man to explain or to cure her, she leans on a broken reed. He believed that Victorian male physicians were ill-informed, prudish, incapable of examining women properly and highly reluctant to give female patients information on birth control. So to me, Drizzle's book certainly was very important in Kingsford's subsequent decision to become a physician herself. But in the meantime, she bought and edited a feminist weekly the lady's own paper. So what had changed or not since 1868? In 1869, John Stuart Mill had published on the subjection of women just after the women's cause had been given momentum when the Liberal Party led by Gladstone won the election of November 1868. Lydia Baker estimated that about 90 supporters of the women's cause had been returned to Parliament. In 1869, Jacob Bright's amendment to the Municipal Franchise Bill allowed rate-paying women to vote. Then in 1870, the Elementary Education Act allowed those same rate-paying women to vote and to sit on the local school boards. However, those civic rights should not be overestimated. They were granted to women because they fit in women's traditional responsibilities over health, education and housing, all considered as part of their extended domestic sphere. And when Jacob Wright introduced the Women's Disabilities Bill to remove all women's electoral disabilities in 1871, it was defeated. Bills on women's suffrage were introduced every year during the 1870s but each failed on the second reading. So, seeing this, women suffragists and their male supporters attempted to build wider support, they sent platform speakers out, they extended their network, they printed quantity of pamphlets, they organized petitions and they lobbied sympathetic MPs. Meanwhile, Sophia Jex Blake and six other women had studied medicine at Edinburgh University from 1869. But they had to face considerable hostility from male students that culminated in the Surgeon's Hall riot of November 1870 when the women arrived to sit an anatomy exam 
and were met by an angry mob of male students. The event won the women many new supporters, but the medical faculty persuaded the university to refuse graduation to them. So the context in which Kingsford edited a feminist weekly was tense and uncertain in spite of some advances, and she and her contributors addressed all of the issues I just mentioned. Now, why a paper? Kingsford, uh, Kingsford actually answered to this question herself as early as 1868 in her essay. She said that now, there are now dozens of serials and other publications being presented to the world of women under the various titles of ladies' magazine, English women's newspapers, young ladies' circulars, journals of the fashion, la mode, etc., etc., all of which are dedicated to ladies. These publications treat of fashionable intelligence, whatever that may be, and instructions on embroidery and pinwork, while the remaining sheets are stuffed with senseless verses, impossible love tales and unnatural sentiment. So Kingsford meant the ladies' own paper as an alternative to such women's periodicals. But she was not the first in this. Barbara Bardichon and Bessie Parks had launched the English Woman's Journal in 1858 as the first feminist periodical, but publication had ended in 1864. In 1870, Lydia Baker had launched in Manchester the Woman's Suffrage Journal that monitored the progress of the suffrage movement, but there definitely was room for a new London feminist paper. The ladies' own paper, here it is, uh, had actually existed before. It had been first launched in 1866 exactly as one of those women's papers criticized by Kingsford. It was advertised as a cheap newspaper for women and uh, it said that it contained all the news of the week, tales by popular writers, music and the drama, fashion, gardening, and everything worth knowing about household matters. By 1872, when Kingsford took control of the paper, it was sold one penny, and it was edited by Georgina Charlotte Clark, who announced in the last issue on the 28th of September, 1872, that a paper would henceforth be edited by Mrs. Adenon Kingsford, whose talents and labours are too well known to require laudatory comments. Which I don't know how to take, exactly. Um, <laughs> now, Kingsford's biographers disagree on how long she edited her papers. Uh, Alan Pert is mistaken when he says that Kingsford only edited four issues in October 1872. She edited the paper at least until the end of December 1872, as evidenced by the copies held by the Bodleian Library. I think Metland also was mistaken when he said that Kingsford's editorship went on for two years, for I found absolutely no trace of the paper in the form she gave it past the 21st of December 1872 issue. So I tend to think that Kingsford's friend Florence Fenwick Miller was right. In all, Kingsford edited the paper for the last three months of 1872, and this is evidenced by the letter, the letter dated January 5, 1873, that Kingsford sent to Miller after Miller had written to her to tell her that she would miss the paper. Now, Kingsford revamped the ladies' own paper as a journal of taste, progress and thought with a quote by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the French philosopher, as its motto, the word is the book of women. This is taken from Rousseau's 1762 essay on education, Les Mille, However, I checked and the whole sentence reads in French, le monde est le livre des femmes, quand elles y lisent mal, c'est de leur faute. The world is the book of women, when they read it wrongly, it's their own fault. 
<laughs> which was actually in keeping with King's thoughts considering women as generally their own enemies in 1868. She priced the paper three pence, meaning she was aiming at a readership socially above the original one. King's Ford address in the first issue, which is this one, uh, exposes a strategy meant to counter what she identifies as a state of affairs which is doing a good cause great harm outside the charmed circle of the Amazonian camp. Namely, the fact that homekeeping wives and women of idealistic tendencies were growing wary of political women. Well, King's Ford clearly put herself and her readers among those political women. She says they imagine us to be a hard and lovely crew. But she aims at proving that they still deserve the title of lady, as she says, and she vindicates their true womanhood. Now, one has to, this sounds of course very conservative, okay, but one has to realize that respectability meant credibility in the Victorian era and that openly departing from the ideal of the perfect lady, the, the way the suffragettes dared to do one generation later, meant social ostracism for middle-class women and indeed harm to their cause. So they had to tread carefully and this is exactly the kind of strategic compromise that Kingsford calls for in her address. But anyway, in this address, she moves quickly from sweetness and refinement to the all-important interest of hygiene. And she invites discussion, I quote, on hygienic and physiological topics and on other matters more generally interesting to the thoughtful and enlightened women. Kingsford also calls for contributors saying that we shall be always willing to give each a fair hearing, and she indeed published articles by the leading women thinkers and campaigners of her time, Barbara Bardichon on civil duties of women, Sophia Jax Blakes on girls' physical education, Frances Pyokarb on women's moral education and on vivisection, Julia Wedgwood on the political claims of women, Florence Fenwick Miller on midwives, and Kingsford also published some male thinkers, so Charles, such as Charles Kingsley on women's education and Archbishop Manning on drink. Through its miscellaneous notes, there are, Kingsford paper also provided information on public lectures on women's rights, on meetings and activities, of the various branches of the National Society for Women's Suffrage and similar groups throughout Britain, but also on university lectures and exams open to women, and she also published exam results. Now, Kingsford's main personal contribution to the paper, that is three to four pages out of every 16 every week, was her novel, In My Lady's Chamber, published in serial form. This melodramatic novel is, to say the truth, mainly a pretext for long dialogues that allow Kingsford to develop in a rather artificial way, in a very artificial way, some of her own feminist views, as in chapter 9 here, through her mouthpiece Diana. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but she, Diana says, the possession of the franchise is the only guarantee of liberty and enlightenment. It will give us the power to agitate for new improvements and fresh reforms, to remedy crying evils and gross abuses of which men take little notice. She calls for a higher and nobler standard of education, moral and intellectual advancement, etc. Now, as it appears, uh, in this passage, and also in an address, Kingsford was typical of a generation of middle-class Victorian feminists in that she did not openly challenge the ideal of the separate spheres, but she called for reform from within the system, using the ideal of the perfect lady to her own ends, and especially the notion of women's supposed greater morality and so-called feminine values uh, to justify more rights. 
A little bit further down, she has Diana say, woman is the arranger, the orderer, the beautifier, the beautifier of home. It is her part to assist in the arrangement, order and comfort of the state. Now, the next point. In his biography of Anna Kingsford, her life, letters, diary and work, Edward Maitland asserts that Kingsford insisted on editing her advertising as well as her literary columns and rigidly excluded notices of anywheres which failed to meet her approval, preparation of meats and hygienic articles or apparel, deleterious cosmetics, etc. Whatever involved death in the procuring or ministered to death in the using was banned or barred. Well, I went through all the ads of the 1872 issues of the ladies' own paper and I found this to be <coughs> untrue, as you can see here. And those ads were actually published in all of the issues. Uh, so, meat tea, and I chose one uh, deleterious cosmetic, but there were actually a number of those. Okay, And there were about three pages of advertisement in all of the uh, all of the issues. So this was uh, not true. Uh, furthermore, true to her address in which she said that she would withhold space from none of the contributors on the ground that we happen to differ on some point from their expressed views and theories, Kingsford published an article by Sophia Jax Blake on women's physical education in which Jax Blake's laments the mischievous absurdity of vegetarianism and she published it. Now, Alan Pert wrote that, I quote, in her youthful enthusiasm, Anna, well he calls her Anna, naively advocated Drysdale's book in an essay. But I think she was well acquainted with his work and knew exactly what she was doing. Furthermore, her views on the extent to which women should have control of their bodies had not changed by 1872. Now, abortion was made officially illegal in England and Wales in 1803. Then in 1861, section 59 of the Offences Against the Person Act provided that uh, whoever shall unlawfully supply or procure any poison or other noxious thing with intent to procure the miscarriage of any woman shall be guilty of a misdemeanor, etc. Yet, uh, abortifacans, okay, abortifacans, that is substances that induce abortion, remained widespread. In fact, most medicines which claim to treat female complaints generally contain some of them. In the advertising, such terms as irregularity, obstruction, menstrual suppression, delayed period, all of those were understood to be euphemistic references to pregnancies that they proposed to terminate. And in 1868, the British Medical Journal complained that more than half of the newspaper advertisements offering medicine for ladies actually offered abortifacients. Okay, I'm almost there. Sorry. Uh, Kingsford paper carried no less than three such ads in all the issues she edited. Always the same ones, okay, those three, in all the issues, you can find them again and again. And she certainly knew what these ads meant, obviously. Furthermore, in the second issue of a paper, Kingsford published an article by Charles Drisdell, that is, George Drisdell's brother, who was just as much of a free thinker and a birth control activist, and who also lectured on the need for women physicians. So, this quick study, well, not so quick, I'm so sorry. This quick study of Kingsford's essay on the admission of women to parliamentary franchise and of her editorship of the ladies' own paper proves, I hope, that Kingsford's commitment to women's rights needs to be reassessed. Her paradoxical feminism tends to be overshadowed by other struggles and a spiritual quest, or summarily dismissed as class-biased and conservative. 
Whereas I think her fight for women's rights had a very radical and subversive side that her somewhat prudish male biographers did not care to acknowledge. And I'm going... Okay, this is uh, the article by Charles Drisdell. And by way of conclusion, I'd like to end on those rather moving idealistic lines penned by Kingsford when she was 21 <laughs> in her 1868 essay to right the grievous wrongs of our abused sex, to procure for its members independence of thought, expression and action, to assert their individuality and to do what one mind can do to defeat the malevolent attempts that custom, bigotry, tyranny and prejudice with all the attendant strains of evils have made and yet may make to subvert womanly dignity. These are the things I live for, the things I'm resolved to work for, the things I would gladly give my life to see accomplished. Thank you. Thank you.